Season 5 begins at John Dutton's campaign headquarters on the night of the election, as his opponent calls John to concede, meaning that the Dutton patriarch will be the next governor of Montana. This was Jamie's dream job, but he had to curb his ambitions for now after Beth forced him to kill his biological father for putting out a hit on the Duttons, and Beth has a picture of Jamie carrying the body, so he will have to be loyal from now on. Even though Jamie offers to introduce John to his supporters, as well as former Governor Linnell Perry, who is now a senator, Jamie is clearly not happy about any of this. He and Beth keep giving each other hateful stares, and Jamie looks dejected whenever he doesn't have to smile for the cameras, which is something that catches the attention of Ellis Steele. Ellis works for Market Equities, who are building an airport on the Dunn Ranch, thanks to Jamie and Linnell's betrayal back in Season 3. They plan to eventually build an entire city around the airport, but with John becoming the new governor, their project is in trouble, and CEO Caroline Warner is losing it because of that. However, Ellis finds a potential way out of this problem, suggesting that they use Jamie against his family, because he doesn't seem super chuffed about his father's victory. Caroline likes that idea, and she wants the gloves to come off now, so she tells Ellis to deploy someone named Sarah Atwood. Going back to the campaign headquarters, John gives a speech to his supporters and assures them that he'll preserve the ranching and farming way of life, and he will prevent Montana from becoming the rich man's plaything. Thomas Rainwater and Mo watch on, and they know that their new casino and hotel project is in trouble, because they relied on market equities to change the landscape to bring in more customers with their airport. Later on, a conversation between John and Linnell reveals that John isn't looking to get re-elected in 2026, so he doesn't have to curry favors and he can just focus on his political agenda. And after some hesitation, he is sworn in as the governor and announces that his first order of business is to cancel funding for the Paradise Valley Airport project. The state was using its eminent domain powers to build the airport on the Yellowstone Ranch, but not anymore. John also reveals some financial measures that will hurt non-residents, affirming that Montana is not their playground. Quote, we are not your haven from the pollution and traffic and mismanagement of your home states. End quote. I'm sure that sentiment resonates with some of you whose states are being flooded by people escaping mismanaged cities. Jamie, though, is worried about some of these measures. He thinks they'll have a hard time arguing for their legality, but Beth doesn't care. She orders Jamie to make it legal. On the drive back to the ranch, Jamie tries to reason with his father by saying that the airport brings in 5 million a year, while the ranch loses 3, so he still doesn't get it at all. He's still thinking about the money. It is not about that. And because of that, John finally has enough, as he goes on a rant about how they are an embarrassment to their ancestors, who sacrificed everything to give them this life and he asks Jamie to sacrifice his ambition and weak, self-loathing heart for the next four years and do everything John tells him to. Later on, John is hosting a celebration party at the ranch, and we see all the ranch hands having some fun. During the party, Beth finds Rip watching from afar, and she joins him, and her mood is soon ruined when Rip talks about how he never worries about the future, but right now he kinda does. He thinks John is like Nero playing the fiddle while Rome burned. He believes that if John has to step up to the plate to preserve their way of life, if he's the only person left in Montana that can do it, they are already doomed. It is too late if it takes a person that hates politics to get involved to save their way of life. And Rip explicitly states that John is going to lose this place. That's the first of three worrying signs for the ranch and for John. The second is when he comes across Carter the next morning. And yes, that really is Carter, the same actor and everything. I had to check if that was the case because the kid looks like he aged at least three years. And that's the point John makes to Carter, saying that Carter is a living reminder of how much time he doesn't have. The third and final worrying sign involves Casey. He's been out near the Canadian border recovering some stolen horses, doing his duty as the livestock commissioner, but he has to rush back to Billings because Monica is having cramps and she's about to have the baby. She starts driving and Casey sends her an ambulance to pick her up at the halfway point. 
badly though. She can't get there. She's losing control because of her cramps. And there's a buffalo on the road. And a driver on the opposite side of the road is losing control trying to pick up some food. Which inevitably leads to a car crash. John arrives at the hospital after learning about this. And Tate tells him that he had a brother. But he only lived for about an hour. Tate also reveals that they named him John, and this is the third sign that John isn't long for this world. And it turns out that John's election win was just a pyrrhic victory. He lost the grandson who was named after him. He has to be away from the ranch he loves in order to keep the ranch intact. His daughter is blackmailing his adopted son to keep him in check. And no matter what John tries to do, tragedy always finds a way to strike his house and his family. There was also that great flashback that showed how Beth tormented Rip when they were young. It was just a classic example of hurt people hurt people. And it showed how she's been able to change and open up to Rip as she apologized for everything she's done to Rip all these years. In episode 2, we see just how determined John is to quash the Market Equities airport project, as he and Beth pressure Jamie to draft an executive order. But first, John has to fire his chief of staff and make Beth accept that position, because he doesn't want to deal with all the usual pointless meetings, which are set up by the regular old political operatives. He asks his assistant Clara to bring in the chief of staff Jim, and fires him on the spot. Linnell can see that John is out of his element, so she explains to him why he has to meet with all sorts of people around the state in order to change laws that will serve his agenda. Otherwise, his adversaries will just wait for four years, and once his term is up, it'll be business as usual. He won't have achieved anything. Jamie, in the meantime, argues against cancelling the airport lease. He leased out that portion of the ranch back in season 3, when he still had power of attorney over the ranch, and he did that in order to avoid losing the land completely. He prevented the state from forcibly buying the land using eminent domain. I think I made a mistake in my previous episode breakdown by saying that the state actually used that power, but no, it was just a lease. The Duns still own the land. Linnell agrees with Jamie and says that if it wasn't for Jamie's lease, this issue would have been raised to the land board and they would have voted in favor of the state owning a part of the Yellowstone Ranch. That's where eminent domain would come into play and then the airport would definitely be built. There would be nothing John could do. So at that point, Jamie seems to have made the right decision, but John still wants to cancel state funding for the airport and he doesn't give a frag about the lease agreement. He'd like Jamie to find a way, even though Jamie insists that they'll be sued and lose for wrongful termination of the lease. He fears that then market equities will be able to buy the land outright, because halting the build will create real damages, and the only way John will be able to pay for the penalty will be to sell his land. This is where Beth chimes in, pointing out the fact that the ranch is an agricultural zone, so they can use that argument to cancel state funding. That is if John can convince two county commissioners to deny market equity's request to rezone. With no rezoning, John will have a reason to cancel the lease. That reason being the fact that an airport can't be built on an agricultural zone. That evening, John meets with the commissioners, asking them to deny the rezoning request. He says they shouldn't worry about the financial benefits of the airport, because the state will make up for it by doubling property taxes on non-residents. John also assures them that there will be no litigation, because right after cancelling the lease, he will put the entire ranch into a conservation easement program, which will limit activities that can be done on that land. Nobody will be able to build condos, hotels or airports on it. That's a nifty move because it will protect the ranch's integrity and wholeness. The downside, as Beth points out, is that they won't be able to sell a part of the land when they need some money. So let's say John passes away in a few years and the kids want to sell off 20% of the land to raise some money. Well, they'll have a hard time doing that because the easement program will limit activities that can be done on that land, like we discussed. The Duns will still be able to run the ranch, but that's about it. 
The commissioners vote with John, which allows him to sign the executive order drafted by Jamie, and Caroline loses it at the market equities offices, but at least her fixer Sarah Atwood has arrived now, and just like Ellis, she notices the fact that Jamie isn't happy about this. He will be her first target, and in the meantime, Caroline orders her goons to file a lawsuit with any charge they can think of. John's brief speech when he signed the executive order was well written. He talked about how building a city in the Montana wilderness is an attack on their freedoms because it would take away the people's freedom to drink clean water and breathe clean air. It would strain the ability of their schools and hospitals and their police, which would in turn force them to raise taxes and that would strain their families to the point where they would wonder if they could actually live there anymore. John goes, quote, that's not progress in my mind, that's an invasion, and the invasion is over, end quote. We go back a few decades to see what John is talking about when he mentions being able to drink clean water. In this flashback, his animals and fish are dying all over the place, and this is caused by chemicals sprayed in order to build a cell tower. The construction foreman is a bit of a dick, and he's aptly named Dick, so John gives him a taste of his own medicine by getting Rip and company to spray Dick's house with those chemicals, and they spray Dick too. That is gonna sound really weird out of context. But anyway, this flashback shows that this has been a very long fight for John. Checking in on Monica, she'll be fine physically, but understandably she is still feeling the impact of losing her baby. Monica wants the baby to be buried at the ranch so that they can always visit, and she asks Casey to talk to his father about it. She also brings up what Casey said after his sweat ceremony at the end of season 4, the fact that he saw the quote-unquote end of us. Casey responds by saying that losing the baby doesn't have anything to do with that, and that he would have to choose the end of us, which is something he will never do. Back at the ranch, Carter rides John's horse and works with all the other ranch hands throughout the day. Everything is going well and Carter is feeling like a real cowboy until his horse steps into a badger hole and gets injured. Rip shoots the horse to give it a peaceful death and Carter's arm is broken, though he will be fine. That's not the last animal death in this episode, as Ryan and Colby get permits to kill a pack of wolves that ate the remains of one of the cows. Ryan doesn't think the wolves killed the cow, but they certainly had a feast afterward, and that is dangerous because they got a taste and they might return for some more. They do indeed return. Ryan and Colby are prepared and they shoot them using thermal scopes. However, they later find out that these wolves are wearing GPS collars, or they were wearing, meaning that they're from the national park, so Ryan and Colby could go away for a long time if this comes to light because their permits don't give them license to shoot these particular wolves. They call Rip and he comes to help them. He tells them to remove the collars and ride to the park while moving like wolves, so it will look like the wolves went back to the park. They end up tying the collars to pieces of wood and chuck them in the river. The collars will eventually get loose and it will look like the wolves lost the collars in the river. At least that's the plan. But at the end of the episode, one piece of wood gets stuck, which might bring about the first scandal of John's tenure. The wolf storyline continues in episode 3 with a flashback, as we go back to the time when wolves were introduced or reintroduced to the national park, with residents around the park being given assurances that the canines won't bother them. That turns out to be a lie, and ranchers from all around Montana voice their frustrations in a council meeting. John has first-hand knowledge that the ranchers are right, because some of his cattle has recently been killed by wolves, and he implies to another council member that if fish and wildlife officers don't come to the ranch before the weekend, he'll have to take matters into his own hands. The council member's name is Keith, he was apparently the biggest advocate for reintroducing the wolves to the park, and in my opinion he is the embodiment of an embarrassing mindset that is still prevalent today, which thinks that nature can be ruled over in its entirety. He had the audacity to think that they could limit the wolves to the boundaries of the park. Wolves had other ideas. This problem has come up again in the present with Ryan and Colby killing some wolves from the park, they had permits, but those don't cover animals from the park. 
and because one of the collars they chucked into the river got stuck, two fish and wildlife officers take notice and they come asking questions, saying they would like to go over the wolf's path on the ranch. Just before this, Rip was having a heart-to-heart -heart moment with Carter as he was feeding a calf and he was wondering what would happen to it when it grew up. Rip goes, quote, Orphans don't get shipped off around here, Carter, in case you haven't noticed. End quote. I think that's my favorite quote of the episode. It is a beautifully written sentence because of how meaningful it is for both characters, since they're both orphans. Back to the fish and wildlife agents, they take Rip with them to the spot where the wolves were killed, though obviously they don't know that. The wolves are most likely buried here, but the ranch hands have smartly been plowing the field, which provides cover for the ranch. GPS shows that the wolves went up to mountains next. We know that was Rip, Colby and Ryan traveling like wolves with the trackers, which they then tossed away. Rip tells them that going up the mountains is dangerous even for good cowboys, and neither agent seems like a good cowboy, so they decide to conduct the rest of the search from a chopper. In theory, that should be that, because they can't come up with any evidence from a helicopter, so all they have is the collar in the river. Rip has already told them it must have been the work of poachers, and that is a reasonable defense when the agents don't have any other evidence. In the meantime, Beth catches John deep in his thoughts on the porch. He's probably thinking about the memory with Keith and the wolves, because Rip told him about the new wolf trouble in episode 2. John doesn't know that the animals were from the park, but yeah, it's on his mind. He doesn't want to talk to Beth about that, so instead he brings up her mother, Evelyn. John is sad that Beth never got the chance to really get to know Evelyn, but this is obviously a touchy subject for Beth with the way Evelyn treated her and raised her like a man so that she would be prepared for the real world. That is one of the main reasons Beth is the way she is. So she advises her father to go out there and make new memories with someone new, and once she gets to her car, she can't hold back her tears. Beth is on her way to the Schwartz and Meyer offices in Salt Lake City, and I think we need some background information before we move on. This is the investment bank Beth used to work for, and together with the Yellowstone Ranch, they bought a lot of land around the ranch in order to put it into a conservation easement program, which would make the bank a lot of money, and it would preserve the ranch's integrity. However, the company's owner, Bob Schwartz, was approached by Market Equities, and he betrayed Beth by letting Market Equities take over. This was a big problem because of all the land around the ranch, but Beth knew she was wanted by Market Equities, so she agreed to work for them in exchange for a controlling interest in Schwartz and Meyer, which meant that she was able to get back at Bob Schwartz. For that controlling interest, she was willing to help Market Equities build their dream city in Montana, but on the condition that they wouldn't touch the Yellowstone Ranch. Caroline agreed at first, only to go back on her word and still include the ranch in their plans. Beth then tried to undermine the airport project by orchestrating a clash between protesters and law enforcement just when the media was paying attention, at which point Caroline fired Beth. Now, Beth still owns a controlling interest in Schwartz and Meyer, but Market Equities will come after her for violating their non-disclosure agreement. After all, she used insider knowledge to protect her family and the ranch. So Beth would like to sell the company before the lawsuit can go through. And luckily, she knows Robert Baldus, the CEO of Person International, who are the biggest competitors of Market Equities. The only thing Beth wants in exchange for the sale of Schwartz and Meyer, which is worth billions of dollars, is the land around the Yellowstone Ranch, which is quote-unquote only worth about 300 million dollars. So Burston International gets to screw over market equities, market equities loses tens of billions of dollars in potential revenue, and Burston adds an impressive investment bank to their portfolio, all for pennies on the dollar. And Beth protects the ranch by selling off something that she would lose in a lawsuit anyway. After the deal is signed, Beth immediately puts the land into the easement program. And when the deal hits the news, the Market Equities Board recalls Caroline to New York. And they want to drop all lawsuits because they know it's an unwinnable battle. 
Caroline knows it too, but she's gonna go down swinging. She's not thinking about the company or the airport. No, all she wants is for the Dutton family to be destroyed at all costs. Caroline instructs Ellis to turn Sarah loose and she leaves Montana. Earlier in the day, Sarah and Ellis met with Jamie and Sarah played the attorney general like a fiddle. She got Ellis to pretend as though he was desperate and outraged, which made Jamie feel superior, as though he had the upper hand. And after Ellis left the room, Sarah expressed how impressed she was by Jamie and she claimed that all she wanted now was a soft landing. They then agreed to have dinner, and I'm positive that Sarah is gonna keep using Jamie's ego and low self-esteem against him. I wonder if he's ever gonna wisen up. Elsewhere, Beth decides to take all the ranch hands to a bar in Bozeman for Lloyd's 58th birthday, despite Rip's insisting that this is a bad idea. And as always, Rip turns out to be right. A woman flirts with him at the bar, calls him a tall drink of water, and he says he's married but she doesn't take no for an answer. When she learns that Beth is Rip's wife, she walks over to Beth and as soon as I saw that Beth had a bottle in her hand, I knew she was gonna smash it in that stranger's head. After all, Beth is the most predictably unpredictable character around. But this time around, she has taken it a little too far, which is what Sheriff Ramsey explains to Rip as he officially arrests her. We met this new sheriff toward the end of last season after Sheriff Haskell passed away, and Ramsey made it clear to John that he wasn't like Haskell, and he proves it in this situation. He shows that he's a straight shooter, but we'll see what he does when the governor gets involved. Talking of the governor, he's got some official business to deal with because Casey steps down as the livestock commissioner and John will need to find someone new to replace him. Casey saw in his vision during his sweat ceremony that he had to choose his path and one of those paths involves his family. He can't have them and be the livestock commissioner and he chooses to prioritize his family. It is difficult to imagine what he'll do next, but Mo recommends talking to Jamie about becoming a state investigator, overseeing tribal land. Apparently they haven't had that kind of help in a long while, so it would be good for the res, and spending most of his time on the res would be a lot more ideal for Casey and his family. As for the funeral, Mo and Rainwater advise Casey and Monica to make it a private event because a traditional service isn't for anybody but the deceased. The only purpose is to make them pass on to the next world. Casey talks to his father about it and John is understanding, so they go to pick a spot for the grave. Afterward, Angela Blue Thunder makes it clear to Rainwater that she is coming after his seat because he is still enforcing the slave rules. Angela wants to actually change things and not be content with the current rules and this reminds me of the first time she appeared on the show when Mo warned Rainwater telling him to watch out for her and here she is. The fourth installment of the season begins with Beth in jail. Jamie tries to explain to her that she is fudged if the California lady shows up today and officially presses charges, but Beth knows Jamie is capable of getting her out of this predicament. All he needs is a bit of motivation, so she tells him to wait for the Cali gal and stop her somehow. The how part is for Jamie to figure out, and he thinks he can dissuade the tourist by threatening to charge her as well. Jamie explains to the beaten up lady that there is no self-defense in a bar fight and that she was the one who stoked the flames that caused the fight. It's not clear how that would hold up in court, but until that court date, the lady would be in jail and she most likely couldn't get bail because she's from out of state and thus a flight risk. And that is why she smartly decides to return to California instead of gearing up for this lengthy battle and Jamie convinces the police and the county attorneys to let Beth out with a disorderly conduct offense. She'll have to do community service and when she complains about that, you see a brief moment of smirking from Jamie, which I found hilarious. It was just for a split second but it was there. This storyline is the perfect demonstration of the saying that no good deed goes unpunished because not only is Beth not appreciative of Jamie's help, but she also freaks out in the car after he agrees to give her a ride. The reason for that is the baby seat at the back of Jamie's car. Upon seeing that, Beth goes, quote, You have my womb cut out of me and God gave you a boy? End quote. 
Jamie has to pull over as Beth attacks him physically. She tries to get away from him after getting out of the car, but he chases her to say that taking her to that abortion clinic and not telling her about the hysterectomy that would sterilize her is the greatest regret of his life. Beth then asks what the baby's name is and she loses it again after finding out that the child is named after Jamie. Quote, of course he is. That's what the world freaking needs. Another freaking you. End quote. Beth promises to take the baby away from Jamie and rob him of fatherhood and they go their separate ways but for a moment there it looks like Jamie is gonna run over Beth as he drives away but he doesn't. John, in the meantime, is busy firing all of his useless advisors, saving the taxpayers more than one and a half million dollars per year in the progress. And what prompts this is their contradictory policy proposals. So, for example, one of their policies suspends natural gas leases on state land to protect and preserve sage grouses. Those are birds. While another policy proposes planting solar panels that would remove sagebrushes in a massive area. Sage grouses live in sagebrushes, so how can these two policies be enacted at the same time? John just can't take it and fires the whole bunch of them. Then, what I'm calling the Wolfgate continues to trouble the ranch. A park official and US Fish and Wildlife agents have an emergency meeting with the governor to discuss this issue. They believe that cowboys from the Dunn Ranch shot the wolves, not knowing that these were park animals, and the assailants covered their tracks by tossing away the collars. That is what the GPS data suggests. John gives Rip a call in front of the officers, and Rip says nothing happened. As far as John is concerned, that's the end of the matter. However, the officers warn John that the collars are tracked by an NGO, and once they put two and two together, they'll come after John with both barrels. The governor's day gets even worse when Jamie gives him a call about Beth's legal trouble, and at this point, Jamie hadn't gotten Beth out yet, so John thinks he needs a crisis manager with all of these problems, but he doesn't have one. That's why he calls Senator Linnell Perry and picks her brain over lunch. It is during this conversation that John realizes he can pardon people even a week into his term, though it would be a bad idea to use that power to free Beth if she were to get convicted, but as we've already established, that is not going to be necessary, and Linnell thinks that what John needs is an environmental advisor who can help him deal with these environmental groups, and luckily for him, he knows just the right person. I'm talking about Summer Higgins. Last season, Beth pitted protesters like Summer against law enforcement so that market equities would suffer a PR hit on their airport project, and the judge tried to make an example out of Summer and sentenced her to multiple decades in prison. John and Summer had gotten to know each other by that point. They got it on, if you know what I mean. And now in the present, John gets her released from prison and makes her his advisor. Even though Summer warns him that she won't sleep with him, that turns out to be a lie. Beth runs into Summer at the house, and these two exchange words. This encounter takes place a few hours after Beth tails Jamie in town. Jamie and Sarah get it on in a bathroom after flirting all night, and Beth seizes this opportunity to check Sarah's purse, and she takes a photo of Sarah's ID. Beth googles Sarah's name at night, but she doesn't come up with anything and that's when she hears Summer running around in the kitchen. Time to rewind a little bit and discuss baby John's funeral. Beth and John make it back in time to the ranch to watch the funeral from afar, but they didn't actually know about the ceremony because they were not invited. Here, John warns Beth to control her impulses, and as Beth walks away, she tells her father that she wants to be cremated. Quote, Turn me to ashes and throw me to the wind. That's all the care I want. End quote. After the ceremony, Rainwater greets John and tells him that even though grief isn't meant to be shared, comfort is. Rainwater also asks John to meet him on the res because people are angry after the cancellation of the airport project, which in turn halted the Rainwater's casino and hotel developments, eliminating 300 jobs for the people of the res. John then approaches Monica, telling her he knows how she feels because he buried his son Lee right here. He tells her a story about his little brother Peter, who only lived for 18 hours after being born early. 
John's parents didn't want to have any other children after that. And when they held John's son Lee in their arms, John's dad told his wife that Peter lived a perfect life. Because all he saw of this planet was his mother and all he knew was that his mother loved him. The same sentiment rings true for Monica and baby John. And this little story does provide some comfort to Monica. She walks away after thanking John and he chats with Casey to tell him that he appreciates the fact that they named the baby John. The governor wants his son to hang on to the livestock commissioner's badge for now until he can find a replacement because this is not the time to stop receiving paychecks. Later that day, Rip and John discuss Wolfgate on the porch and Rip says sorry for the mess. They also talk about the fact that John's horse was buried with baby John. They try to figure out why that was the case. Rip thinks the baby might ride the horse in heaven, which is why this episode is titled Horses in Heaven. In reality, Rainwater explained in episode 3 that Casey's son needs a horse spirit to carry him to the other side. And Rainwater also claimed that God would have the horse ready when baby John was ready. So well, that's why the horse stepped into a badger hall while Carter was riding it and Rip had to shoot the horse so that it wouldn't suffer. They believe that now that horse spirit is carrying baby John to the other side. Governor Dunn decides to spend a few more days on the ranch in episode 5 as Rip and company prepare to brand their cattle. Other ranchers have been asking the Duttons for help and they even helped out another ranch in episode 4, but they know they gotta take care of their own business before helping others. John will join in on the fun too, and I'm using the term fun loosely here, because they'll be on horseback for two days to round up the cattle and bring them back to the ranch. And Clara puts together a publicity event for when they return to show the world what their lifestyle is about. And she's going to make a guest list for this event, which will allow the governor to get through a couple weeks worth of meetings in just one afternoon. With that settled, John makes some time for his frowning daughter, who throughout this episode makes at least 20 jokes about Summer and John's involvement, and most of them are great. John tries to argue that Summer is there mainly for her environmental expertise. She will help him navigate environmental issues. Beth doesn't buy that. She goes, quote, You invited your worst enemy to sleep in your bed. And if you think that she was freaking you last night, give her three months. The real freaking is coming. End quote. According to Beth, Summer is no different than Dan Jenkins or Market Equities. What they all want is the land. And at this point, I can't help but agree with Beth. Later on, Rip is surprised to find out that Beth wants to come along for the ride. She's usually not a big fan of horses, considering her past with them. We had a flashback all the way back in Season 1, which showed Beth's horse getting anxious and knocking out her mother Evelyn's horse. And here, Evelyn suffered fatal injuries, and they were far away from the ranch, so Beth wasn't able to get help in time. Back to the present, Beth doesn't say outright that she wants to come along for the ride. She expects Rip to implore her and convince her. And Rip, being the good husband he is, does so with a smile. The very first scenes of this episode might explain Beth's thinking here. She has a dream about their teenage years when she was constantly mean to Rip. She wakes up in the middle of this and talks about this with her husband, saying that yesterday is what eats her. Rip responds by telling her that he doesn't think about the past. Quote, Yesterday is what eats everybody. That's why I don't think about it. End quote. So then Beth borrows a page from Rip's book. She tries to ignore her past with horses and decides to ride with him. This particular storyline is a subtle one and it might get lost in the middle of all the flashy moments we had later on in the episode, which is why I appreciated it a lot. They pulled a bit of Beth's backstory from season 1 and allowed her to take a step forward. And she didn't do it all alone. Rip held her hand along the way. So this was an incredibly meaningful sequence. Elsewhere, Casey and his family arrive at the ranch for the ride. We saw them earlier outside their house discussing this invitation. Casey was crying for a second because he was worried about his family after what happened to baby John. And Monica thinks that Casey should keep his job as the livestock commissioner because nothing can come between them. Monica also says, let's go to the ranch for the roundup, though she's not going along for the ride. Casey and Tate are. 
Just before they arrive at the ranch, we see Clara being told to bring a satellite phone on the ride. And after seeing Casey, Clara asks John if Casey is his youngest son. And John says Casey is his only son. What he means is Casey is the only son he's got left. Lee got shot at the start of the show, while Jamie betrayed the family on multiple occasions. This fatherhood discussion is brought up once again toward the end of the episode, when Rip and John share a drink following Beth's shenanigans. Here, John says he's got one son he misses, meaning Lee, one that he pities, that's Casey, and another one he regrets, which is Jamie. As for Beth, John envies her because she is the embodiment of freedom. She often does whatever she wants, whenever she wants it, with little care for what the world might think. In that sense, Beth is similar to her ancestor Elsa, who we saw in the Yellowstone prequel titled 1883. Others envied Elsa's freedom too, just like John is envying Beth's. So what shenanigans was I talking about? Well, you know about Beth's dinner table anxiety. She cannot stand that room and that table because for her, it is the symbol of the lie of the Dutton family. She doesn't believe they are a real family, they're broken. And the memories of that table overwhelm Beth with anxiety whenever she is there. That's why she keeps acting out. And that is why she doesn't sit at the main table when dinner is ready to be served. But John makes a huge mistake. He goes and fetches her, telling her to keep it cool. But John, Rip and Carter all know what's coming when they watch her gulp down a drink. Just look at their faces, it's hilarious. And oh boy, let me tell you, the hilarity does not stop there. Summer has a meltdown when she sees all the game meat that is being served, and she preaches her cause and believes harder than a pastor in Alabama. While Summer complains about the fact that they are serving Dove, the bird of peace, Casey goes, Dove's pretty good, and he snatches one and Monica just cannot contain her laugh, and neither could I. Her laugh sounded so genuine that I think it might have been unintentional at first, but either way, after that I laughed out loud for two minutes straight. Her laugh was contagious and I liked the fact that they didn't just sit there all serious because, as Monica said, the tension was making it so uncomfortable, both for these people to sit there and for us to watch. Poor Gator, he was just trying to answer Summer's questions and he had no idea what was going on. It was just priceless and too funny for words. Probably Monica's best moment in five and a half seasons. I mean, it's been a few hours since I watched that, and I still laugh whenever I think about it. Beth feels insulted by Summer's demeanor, and she tells Summer to take a walk outside with her. So they leave, and everybody starts laughing except Rip. He's worried this is gonna get out of hand, and after a while, he goes outside to see what they're up to. They're beating the living crap out of each other in a clumsy manner. So Rip goes, quote, Do you know how stupid you both look? You look ridiculous, end quote. He gives both of them a good telling off, asking them if they're gonna beat the other into respecting their opinion. Neither of them has had enough though, so he thinks they should just stand here and trade punches. They do that and Summer gives up after a while, and ultimately Beth helps her up, telling her to show everyone in this household some respect. Then Summer will get back the respect she gives. They rejoin the table with blood all over their faces and as they continue to debate, this time in a more civilized manner, John decides he's had enough and leaves to have a drink. The table is much calmer in the morning as everybody has their breakfast in silence before they head out for the roundup. Before leaving, Beth suggests Summer to explore the ranch. She's not coming along for the ride, and neither is Monica. And Beth wants Summer to think if there's a better preserved or loved forest in the country. Beth wants to see if Summer can call these ranchers her enemy then. After saying goodbye to Casey and Tate, Monica cries as she watches them ride away, which was a great way to end this episode, but we are not done. We gotta mention Jamie for a second. He is visited by Sarah in his office, and she is there to seduce him once again. Jamie argues that what they did was unprofessional, and that he knows what Sarah is doing. She is trying to get him to recuse himself from representing the state against market equities. However, Jamie points out the fact that the state hires outside counsel for litigation, so he wouldn't actually have to recuse himself. 
He looks at Sarah with a smirk and she starts unbuttoning her dress and they presumably get it on. The cattle roundup is the main attraction of episode 6 and it starts off with John getting away from Beth to enjoy the scenery in peace. Even though Beth is sassy at first, she warms up to the whole thing and tells Rip not to call this work again because it's too fun. They gather up the cattle without a hitch and even have some time to rest before heading back to the ranch in the morning. So Tate goes fishing with Emmett Walsh, who's an old friend of John and a fellow rancher, while Rip takes Beth to the spot where they would have married at if, you know, Beth didn't rush the wedding. Back in season 4, she wanted a place with no memories where they would make their own memories. And at the start of this episode, she said she can't appreciate a view or a land that is too vast. So Rip takes her to this meadow and she is awestruck. They rest here for a while before they get it on. Beth says all she needs is cigarettes, whiskey, a meadow and you, meaning Rip. And thanks to the man himself, she's got all of those things. Not only has he found this meadow, but he's also brought with him some whiskey and cigarettes. That is where the title of this episode comes from. Meanwhile, Monica is helping Gator back at the ranch. And when Summer joins them, Monica makes a remark about Summer not being from around here because she doesn't offer to help. The fact that Summer is from the city leads to a discussion about places like this versus cities. Monica says fires cleanse the forest, blizzards and rain protect it and feed the rivers. But when those things happen in cities, which is where Summer normally lives, cities can't cope with it because cities defy nature. They are the opposite of it and that's why they crumble. Their conversation continues in the family graveyard where we see James Dutton's grave he is John's great-great-grandfather and he died in 1893. This tombstone looks like it reads John, but I'm pretty sure it's James because of the date of death. It is probably a blunder. We also see Margaret's grave. She was James' wife. The next morning, John realizes that his friend Emmett has passed away. Just the previous night, they were talking about how that day was perfect or darn close to it. And before the ride in episode 5, John asked Emmett if he was ready for one last ride. So Emmett died doing what he loved, like a cowboy should, head resting against the saddle, staring at the stars. Clara calls in an EMT chopper to pick up Emmett's body. She and John stay behind until the EMT arrives while the others make their way to the ranch with the cattle. This duo catches up to the herd and John has a chat with Emmett's wife to inform and console her. The festivities must go on though because that's what Emmett would have wanted. So they have a good old party after branding the cattle. Senator Linnell Perry is there too and she can't believe what John did with Summer, commuting her sentence and placing her on house arrest in his own house. Quote, there's politically incorrect and then there is politically illiterate. You are the latter. End quote. John and Linnell have had an on and off thing throughout the show's history, so there's a personal angle here too, besides the political stuff. And Linnell is apparently seeing the Secretary of Energy, and John can't believe she's involved with that quote-unquote friggin' hypocrite. Later on, Summer refuses to dance with John and tells him to go over to his MILF senator, so Summer is jealous too, and he goes over to Linnell and dances with her. So some funny moments here with John's relationship shenanigans. At the same time, Ryan dances with his singer girlfriend Abby and a girl teaches Carter to dance. But let's get to some actually important stuff here. Linnell mentions that the president is coming to Montana and she thinks John should be in Helena the next day to meet him. John disagrees and says that he is busy branding calves. So if he wants, the president can come out here. By this point, we had already learned about the president's arrival because Angela Blue Thunder and the tribal council put together a speaking engagement at the Broken Rock Reservation. So the president is gonna show up there. They did this without asking for Thomas Rainwater's approval. So Mo and Rainwater were shocked to find out about this. 
We learn that Angela is the president's director of Native American Affairs, and she'll make sure that the president endorses Martin, who wants to replace Rainwater as the chairman following the market equities fiasco that shattered Rainwater's hotel and casino plans. Rainwater makes his disapproval of Angela's tactics known. He thinks that the president is coming here for publicity more than anything. Obama visited Standing Rock before running a pipeline through it. So these events don't mean much for the native people. But nonetheless, Rainwater has to join the event because his absence would be used against him. Angela had warned him that she'd show him how to play by the master's rules, and she's done that. Getting the president to show up on the reservation while Rainwater can't even convince Governor Dutton to appear is definitely a bowler move. Back in the city of Helena, Jamie has brought Sarah to his house and they've been doing the deed, though Jamie is still not convinced that Sarah's intentions are pure. She tries to reassure him and she wants to know if he is insinuating that she would sleep with someone for her job and she is successful. Sarah wants to make Jamie the governor. She admits that that wasn't what she had in mind until she met him, and she doesn't hide why either. She would like Jamie to reinstate the market equities airport lease and reverse the state's policy of trying to slow down or even halt growth, and she thinks that Jamie would allow that progress. They continue their conversation in the shower and Jamie agrees to give Emmy what they want, while Sarah says four years is too long of a time to wait, alluding to John's term, which means she will try to figure out a way to neutralize John to make Jamie the top dog. This is in line with their discussion later on in the day. They are watching John console Emmett's wife on TV, and Jamie thinks his father can fall in manure and still come up smelling like a rose, and Sarah responds by telling him they can't let John show up to the fight. That is the only way for Jamie to win. The main storyline of episode 7 begins on the campsite that was set up for the roundup. What we saw in episode 6 was not the whole herd, that was just the beginning, and so they will continue to brand their cattle. John takes in the scene as all the cowboys get set up and he tells Rip that of everything they do, this is his favorite part. Rip likes it better when it's done and there are no problems. Talking of problems, throughout the day, ranch hands keep finding stillborn buffalo calf and John suspects this is caused by brucellosis. Buffalo wanders into the ranch from the national park and brought brucellosis, and if John's cattle get this disease, the state will have to kill the whole herd. They bring the next batch of cattle to the ranch to brand them, and they also vaccinate them against brucellosis. Even Summer chimes in, although she comes this close to having a full-on nervous breakdown. The immediate financial outlook isn't too bad, considering that the herd is insured, so if the state were to kill the cattle, financially it would not impact the ranch right away. However, John makes a good point about how they can't replace 100 years of genetics, as that's how far back the lineage of this cattle goes. And because they can't use the south pasture due to the risk of brucellosis, and because the lower valley is dry, John thinks in order to feed the cattle, they need to send half to herd elsewhere for about a year. Sending 5,000 cows away means they'll need some babysitters in the form of cowboys, and so Rip puts together a team for this task. Rip himself will lead the venture down south. Ryan, Walker, Jake, and Teeter will come along. Gator will be needed too, for cooking purposes. But first, John has to lease some land for grazing, and inside the house he comes across Beth, with whom he discusses the financial part of this plan. A hundred thousand acres at $14 an acre would be $1.4 million per month, and at first Beth thinks it's per year, so she's flabbergasted when she realizes it's actually per month. They're gonna have to take out a $14 million loan for that, because they're gonna stay out there for about a year, and Beth thinks his father should just sell the cattle now, though she can't believe how cheap they are. It is approximately worth one and a half dollars per pound, and that doesn't seem fair to Beth because steaks are thirty dollars, and even ground beef is five. So because of that, Beth thinks they're in the wrong business, and she believes this lease plan will be the end of them. In order to prevent that, she takes a page out of the Four Sixes Ranchers book, who are selling their own beef online, and they are making bank. 
They've sold 8 million pounds of beef this year, and Beth wants to get in on this action too. John is hesitant, but Beth urges him to trust her because this is her job. She has made deals worth $100 million before, so it looks like the Duns will take out a loan, and they'll have to stay patient for a couple of years until they start making a profit from this beef selling business. In the meantime, John has been in touch with the Four Sixes Ranch to find a grazing lease, and they've found a ground in eastern Colorado, north of the Panhandle in Texas. Rip has lined up the trucks and he's ready for the journey, but first he's gonna take Beth and Carter to the county fair to have some fun. Quite a few prominent characters are at the county fair. Beth decides she'll move to a city near the grazing land to be with Rip, while Abby is heartbroken about Ryan leaving, so they break up for now. Colby wins Teeter a toy bear, or bar as Teeter puts it. Carter and Tate hang out, and we learn that Tate is a good shot, like his father. And Summer opens up to John about how she was wrong to judge him and his family's lifestyle. She understands what it is they're trying to preserve now that she has spent some time there. And John doesn't mind the crowd seeing him with Summer, and they kiss while John uses his hat as cover. Elsewhere, Jamie is back to conspiring against his father, and in his conversation with Sarah, he manages to sound reasonable. He talks about how he was supposed to be a cowboy, and how that is all he ever wanted, but John had different ideas and sent him to law school. So Jamie is in disbelief, because John hates him for becoming the very thing he forced him to become. Jamie knows he's not getting John's love, but he would have liked his father's approval and appreciation for his sacrifice. Then Sarah argues that John is scared of Jamie, and that he's also scared because the future of the ranch depends on its evolution. Jamie and Sarah agree that the future of the cattle industry in the US is no future, because in 20 years Brazil will be to American beef what China is to American manufacturing. She firmly believes that Montana's future depends on tourism, hence the reason they need to revive the Market Equities Airport project. The next day, Ellis and Sarah talk to Jamie in his office about Beth's move to place the ranch into a conservation easement program, which practically makes it impossible for Emmy to develop that land even if they somehow acquire it. And so Emmy's next move is to sue the state for $4 billion in New York for negotiating in bad faith. That amount is 10% of Montana's GDP, and because John is responsible for this lawsuit, Sarah thinks this is an impeachable offense. Jamie's argument will be this. Not only has the governor made the state lose out on thousands of jobs and billions of dollars in revenue per year, but he's also dragged the state into litigation, which will cost them billions more. He is bankrupting the state and must be impeached. Jamie will bring forward this motion at the next state assembly session, and Sarah says they will fund Jamie's campaign if the impeachment is successful, and he will become the next governor of Montana. That is not all the political drama from this episode, because we find out that the president's visit to the Brock and Rock Reservation had something to do with two new pipelines that will go through the res. Senator Linnell Perry informs Rainwater of that, and they agree to appear before the press to protest this decision. Rainwater wants John there too, but Linnell doesn't think that's happening. Other than that, we had a flashback that showed how Rip killed a ranch hand by the name of Rowdy. Beth used this fella to make Rip jealous, and one night as they're watching the herd, Rowdy makes the mistake of talking about Beth, Rip makes him pay by beating him, Rowdy then brings a knife to a fistfight, and Rip uses a rock to make Rowdy regret it. Afterward, Rowdy is in so much pain that he can't ride back to the ranch, so Rip goes to get some help. He tells the truth to John, because when John first took Rip in, that's what he asked of him. When they get back to Rowdy, he is dead, and John agrees to help Rip clean this up, on the condition that Rip becomes part of this ranch until the day he dies, meaning that he will get branded and join this mafia-like organization that already includes Lloyd. Rip is fine with that, and he and Lloyd get rid of the body. Lastly, there was a scene at the start showing Beth being mean again, to Summer and also to Abby and Laramie, 
After this trio leaves, Monica points out how cruel Beth is, but Beth doesn't do that to Monica, and Monica says she doesn't need to be treated differently just because she lost a child. Beth disagrees because she knows what Monica is feeling. She's lost a child too, though in wildly different circumstances. Nonetheless, for the first time, Beth talks to someone about losing a child, but she doesn't mention Jamie. She says she's keeping this a secret because of all the people it would hurt, and keeping this truth inside her is not what makes her mean. She was this way long before this tragic event. The impeachment storyline is at the center of episode 8, which is the mid-season finale. While Jamie delivers his motion to set up a Senate tribunal seeking impeachment, John pays a visit to the Brocken Rock Reservation to publicly support Rainwater's fight against the pipeline plans. Jamie's speech is about how John's actions drag the state to litigation because of damages, and even though Jamie can't point to a specific code or conduct violation, sometimes conjecture is all you need to get started. Representatives will think that if John's son is willing to stand up to his father after publicly supporting him during the campaign, this must be serious and worth looking into. So the assembly votes 67 to 33 in favor of setting up the first ever impeachment tribunal in the history of Montana, and after looking into Jamie's allegations, they'll decide whether or not to impeach John. The news of Jamie's shenanigans travel fast, journalists at the pipeline event start asking John about it, which takes the spotlight away from Rainwater, who's now gonna be in an even tougher spot, because this publicity event protesting the pipeline plan won't get any publicity. Beth finds out about what Jamie's done from Summer, they get their usual insults out of the way first, and then Beth watches Jamie's speech on Summer's laptop. At night, Beth goes to Jamie's place, and he doesn't answer the door, so of course Beth picks up a rock and blasts her way in. Jamie tries to get her to leave, but she slams his head with the rock. Beth urges him to resign if he doesn't want his infamous photo published, which Beth took when Jamie was dumping his biological father Garrett's body, and at last, Jamie does the reasonable thing, the thing he should have done at the end of season 4, he calls Beth's bluff, because exposing that location would be the end of the Dutton family, not just Jamie's. In fact, we have a flashback at the start of this episode showing young Rip and young Lloyd dumping Rowdy's body at that location, and afterward, John gives Rip a choice. He could belong to the ranch forever by getting branded, or he could leave to the train station. This is like becoming a made man in the mafia, and we all know which decision Rip made. Back to the present, Beth didn't know about the train station up until this point. She saw Jamie dumping a body at that location, but she had no idea that John and Rip have been using the same spot for years. She realizes now that she's got nothing on Jamie. Jamie then talks about how the airport project was the only option to monetize the ranch, and how the cattle business will cause them to lose the ranch. He says he's trying to make sure that the ranch is passed down to Casey's son Tate and his own son Jamie Jr. Quote, that is the promise that I made and that is the promise I'm gonna keep. The greatest threat to that ranch is our father, and you know that too, so I will remove the threat. End quote. This is when Sarah walks downstairs and Beth asks her if she's enjoying her marionette, and Sarah goes, every inch of him, which was a decent comeback. Jamie insists that the war is over, but Beth believes it is just beginning. She then visits her father, who was watching the news about Wolfgate, so when it rains it pours, that scandal is another problem for him now. She asks him about the train station, and he explains by saying that it's the trash can for everyone who's attacked them. It's a county in Wyoming with a population of zero, so in theory, it is a jurisdictional dead zone because they can't convene a jury of your peers. Their conversation concludes with Beth suggesting that they take Jamie there to solve this problem once and for all, and we don't hear John's answer, but in the meantime, Jamie knows what Beth will want to do, so he wants to play offense himself. He doesn't want to just wait around and play defense. He asks Sarah if she knows any companies that can handle this sort of work, and apparently she does. They are professionals and they'll make it look like a natural death or an accident, not a hit job. So Jamie is definitely going after Beth, but Sarah insinuates that they should maybe go after John too. And she doesn't say that explicitly, but I'm pretty sure that's what she's talking about, and Jamie agrees. 
Jamie's potential has been unlocked by Sarah. Doesn't matter if she's using him or not. What matters is, Jamie is actually an intimidating threat now. And his justification for his actions sounds reasonable. His motive is clear. And you could make the argument that he is in the right, because his enemies are no better than him. And in fact, they made him the man he is today. I'm not sure if I would make that case, but it can be made, which is a sign of good writing in my opinion. It allows you to root for one side or the other with solid arguments. And I think this is a natural breakpoint in the season, so I like how the first part of the season concludes and what it sets up for part 2. That said, we aren't done yet. We gotta rewind and talk about some scenes from the ranch. Rip and all the other cowboys are loading up half the herd onto trucks for their journey down south, and Monica is watching them as John approaches her. She thanks him for his words during the funeral of baby John, saying how much that has helped her, and then John has something to ask of her. With his busy schedule in Helena, and with Rip going to the panhandle, John needs someone to run the ranch, and that someone is Casey. Monica is okay with that and she says all John ever had to do was just ask, which until now he hasn't done. John then goes over to Casey and talks to him about this. Casey says he's gotta talk to Monica and John hugs his son and says he loves him before leaving. This was a really touching moment because it's rare. We don't see John expressing his affection in this way, but at this moment, because he knew he could rely on Casey, he felt like showing his love. Monica and Casey talk afterward. They agree to check out the home at East Camp and move there. Casey is a bit hesitant because in his vision at the end of season 4 he had to choose between Monica and this place, meaning the ranch, but Monica says maybe the East Camp location is a compromise, so Casey is moving back to the ranch. Carter in the meantime continues to hang out with the girl he met at the branding. Teeter tells Colby she loves him before leaving for the panhandle, and she gets on her way with Walker, Jake, Rip, and Ryan. We also check in on Jimmy, who's living his best life at the Four Sixes Ranch with Emily, and he'll probably help out the Yellowstone Cowboys once they get there. The second part of Yellowstone Season 5 will air this summer, but until then you can watch a ton of content on my channel, including Season 5 episode reviews with more of my thoughts, recaps of all the previous seasons, videos on 1923 and 1883 which are Yellowstone prequels. The links to all of those and more can be found in the description box. For now, leave a like on this video if it was helpful, subscribe for more movie reviews and TV show breakdowns, and I'll see you in the next video.